Hey there, it's Brian Sebastian. Movie reviews and more worldwide TV entertainment. Women on TV. TV, iTunes 247 out of Franklin, Tennessee, iHeartRadio, Pandora, all the platforms around the world. And I've been looking forward to this because we've never met, but I like what this man has to offer. All right, Mike, tell us who you are, where you're coming from. Okay, my name is Mike Barilla. I'm a former Stanford All-American quarterback, a former Pro Bowl quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles, a former 25-year uh, attorney, and now I'm a uh, playwright, a stage actor, and the most important thing I'm doing now is I'm an audio book developer. And I recently have an audio book called Mark of the Beast, which was a seven-year project that went live on June 1st as an audiobook. It's actually in a screenplay format with uh, 28 voices. 27 of them were performed by Paul Rohr and the other voice, um, Abaddon the Destroyer, no, excuse me, he was Hunter the Demon, was performed by a friend of mine, Roger Rod. So I have a new audio book out there, but my background, I, I'm from the sports world. Have you always had this ability? Because a lot of athletes don't get credit for, you know, they look that one way, but nobody really is one way. There's always a book in per some person. There's always a story in that person. You've always kind of had this in you, haven't you? You know, when I was in high school, I remember hearing the phrase Renaissance man. And when I heard that, it was someone who had a lot of interests, and I realized that was me. I was a perhaps a world class athlete in high school, college, and pro ball, but my interests were always in reading, and I was extremely interested in musical theater. I saw the uh, incredible uh, musical called Pippin when I was a, a rookie or a second year at Philadelphia and that particular musical with the theme song, Corner of the Sky stayed with me for 40 years. And then when I morphed into a writer at 60, I of course started writing musicals and had Corner of the Sky in my first four musicals. No, that, none, of, none of that surprises me because my favorite musical is Fiddle, Fiddler on the Roof and West Side Story. So I get that. And as that movie guy, it, kind of, it totally makes sense. But what I, the reason why I was interested in that because your brain of how you wrote this is very intriguing to me. Seeing things that are happening today that you talked about years ago. Talk about that. Well, uh, you're right. I, Actually, one of the scenes that I wrote in there, I wrote 10 years ago. Uh, and some of the scenes were seven years ago, and most of it was five years ago. And uh, I, people were so mad at me when I first started showing it to them five years ago, but I put it on ice for about three and a half years. And then when I started seeing things that were happening that I'd written about, I go, this is time to release this. So um, I have been unusual in that since I was about 21 years old, I have been constantly reading the Bible. And I was someone who actually never watched TV. Uh, the last TV series I watched was something called Bonanza in high school. So I basically spent a lot of time reading the Bible and uh, reading books. And so I saw different things in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Jeremiah that I incorporated into this science fiction dystopian saga. So what it is, this particular uh, thing is script is a combination of autobiography, nonfiction about me. Uh, my character, Young Buck, is the main, the main character. And it also is science fiction. And then I incorporated Bible prophecy into it. Since I have been constantly reading the Bible since I was 21 years old, and I'm now 70, whenever I write, Bible verses always show up. Why? Because they're pretty much in my mind. And I, I kind of see the, the world through a, a biblical lens. 
And the thing about that is so precise. I see this done either through like a Netflix or Amazon Prime. That's how I see it. And it's perfect because all that tells me is that you are ahead of other people. And me and my friend were talking about these things last night. Sometimes when you're out there, we have to wait for the world to kind of catch up with us while we're still going forward and doing our other things, right? Exactly. Uh, there's a verse that talks about it. There is a way that seemeth right unto man that whose end is death and destruction. So the herd is going in one way, in one direction. And part of the, the battle that life is, is that you have to go in the opposite direction of the herd. And so consequently, I've always felt throughout my life in college and the NFL, and, and certainly here as a writer uh, of audio books, that I'm always going in the opposite direction as everyone else. So you're constantly bumping into everybody else, but you have to keep going in the way that you're supposed to go, which is the opposite direction as everybody else. And so consequently, you're right. I'm probably ahead of the curve. You know, when I started writing this, I wrote it as a screenplay to be made into a movie. Well, when I was writing it, all the movies that were being made were Marvel comic book movies. Well, this was not a Marvel comic book movie, or this was not the eighth Joker movie. So I go, Mike, nobody in Hollywood is going to make this into a movie. movie so you're going to have to shop it around to some independent people. Uh, perhaps to make it in the movie. And that, but now what has happened is the Hollywood that I used to know, from what I hear is, is really changing right now and is in the process of going back to getting away from the Marvel comic book movies and the uh, eight uh, Joker movies and doing character-driven movies, which is what uh, Mark of the Beast is. It's a character-driven screenplay. It's perfect timing for you. And as that person who's interviewed a lot of these people who are doing these, I say Marvel and the DC world, it makes sense because a lot of independent filmmakers need content like this. The studios need content like this. You know, with this pandemic, and uh, you, I'm sure you can relate to this. And Katarina Gazayas, who's one of my friends, and Susan, who, who, who you're going through, who I adore, I told Katarina about this two years prior to what was going to in 2019, January 2019, I started telling her. By the time, almost this time, two years ago, we were in, we were in Franklin, Tennessee. We had two million views at that point, getting ready to do our panel. I said, "This is what's going to happen for the rest of the year." Oh, and by the way, don't go to Denver because there's a bunch of things coming on. Because I can see how the world is changing due to climate control, whether people believe it or not. So your screenplay, your book, perfect timing. Congratulations on that with you, Mike. And I, and I really like this because what I've read so far, what I've been able to get through, I like this young buck character. And how much of that young buck, I should say, that old goat is really you now? That, that old goat is me. And that's the autobiography part. Uh, if you go in the first scene there, young buck is in a cave in the east rim of the Grand Canyon with his wife, Annie, and, and his uh, son with Down syndrome six-year-old son, Ryan. Well, uh, I'm married to Annie, I live with Annie, and, but our son, Ryan, is 25 years old. He has Down syndrome. And so I made Ryan's character six years old and they are pretty much the, the heroes. And um, the other thing that happened there, I do have some of the stories that happened to me uh, when I was with the Philadelphia Eagles. You probably haven't got to the scene yet where one of my linebacker friends uh, eats glass as a pregame ritual. So that's a little bit later. Yeah, we got there yet. But I put in about three or four stories uh, from my uh, Eagles career. And also from the fact that uh, my friend, Roger Rod, who uh, uh, is the voice of Hunter the Demon in there, was the one that nicknamed me Young Buck when I was uh, a 19-year-old at Stanford. So Young Buck is my nickname. When you see how the world is today, what was it like for you being locked down? You kind of seeing little bits and pieces of these coming, you being that person who's always started reading the Bible and where we are today, how does that make you feel? And where do you see where we go from now? Well, here's the way I felt. Uh, one of the things I explained, uh, described my Young Buck in there as a, 
he describes himself as a uh, lone wolf hermit kind of guy. And that's kind of the way I am. So yeah. no, my life didn't change much at all during the pandemic. I went out to coffee shops a little bit less and Annie and I went out to restaurants a little bit less, but we had a, a great scream in time. And what it did, I, it, for me, this, the, the, the 13 month uh, pandemic uh, really gave me a chance to finish up some loose ends. And I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to finish Mark of the Beast and get it launched if it hadn't been for the, the, the pandemic. So I'm glad it happened. I really, it was a really good time for us. As far as what it's done to the, the planet, uh, I feel like it, uh, it's the planet is, and especially the United States, is Humpty Dumpty. It has been broken and it's never gonna be put back together again. It, it will still be there, but it's gonna be vastly different. And I'm dealing now with a lot of my friends that are actually dealing with depression and they don't know what to do. They're, they're losing their jobs or their business is just falling apart. And they're trying to figure out what new business to do. And they're going through the, this depressed state. Uh, the word that shows up when I think of what has, has done to the United States is the word languish. Everybody is languishing. They're really having a tough time with this. And there is this sense, and this is, you know, when I wrote uh, the Mark of the Beast, I, 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 was ta I knew about some uh, virus that was coming. That's been talked yeah. about for about 10 years. And I don't think the virus, this COVID-19, is the one that I wrote about. I think there's going to be a, a different virus come down the pike that is going to be more dangerous and it will be uh, much deadlier. And that's when they will make the uh, vaccine with the RFID chip in it mandatory. Well, you're so right. So again, what you just said, this is what I've been telling people. And I, and I go back to May of 2019 when I picked Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, I just knew then. And then October 3rd of 20, October 3rd of, yeah, October 3rd of 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was that you May of 2018, October 3rd of 2018. That's when I created, uh, you know, I started seeing all these things exactly how you were writing your book years ago. All you did was just fine tune it. So you were one of those people who had an inkling of how things were changing. And that's why the young buck character to me is interesting because you could see, how do you explain this to a lot of people? You really can't. And you're right. Uh, so you may be the 30th person, uh, just like myself, that had a good year last year because we were kind of prepared for everything. Again, you kind of wrote about it. So this is why people should see, you know, write, you know, not only have your book made into a film or TV series, that's one of the reasons why they should pick it up and read it. And for those people who are suffering from anxiety and depression, yes, this will actually help them a little bit because they get a chance to go outside of their mind, if that makes sense. Do you agree with that? I do agree with it. I actually think it's a, it, it's pretty dystopian, but it, there is a positive message at the end. And I, I designed it, I, I, I wrote it because I wanted to help people. I wanted to warn them about some of the things that were coming. One of the things I wrote about in there, and I wrote this five years ago, was martial law. And when I wrote about it and showed it to people, they all yelled at me, go, United States will never have martial law. Well, now when I say martial law, everybody goes, well, I think California had that last year, you know, or they, I think Seattle had it last year. Well, they know that it's not that far off if we have a new pandemic this autumn, that there could be national, uh, you know, martial law with a 9 p.m. Uh, curfew, and that's what I have in there was a is a 9 p.m. Uh, curfew. Well, I wrote that five years ago, and now martial law is not a big deal. People kind of realize that they see this other side of government. It, it, it's a nice guy for a while, and then it can turn on you real quick and become Big Brother and want to stamp your life out. Well, what I say to people, if you don't adapt and adjust to the new change, not only will you lose your business or your life, you will lose both. And this way of telecommunications is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. And I see the studios have not come back to the lot yet. One, they don't really have to. 
they're saving money, even though they lost a lot of money last year. And I saw this with the movie theaters and I'm a movie whore. When I wasn't going to the movies and I was telling these people, the theaters out of Regal, out of Tennessee, where we have huge numbers, we have 4 million, almost 400,000 views every day and counting. Our numbers always go up, they never go down, they never stay stagnant. I'm like, you guys got to change things. When I was reaching out to the cruise ships, Norwegian cruises, I was telling them, written in your book, Mike, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things like you got to keep this stuff going. And if you don't listen, you don't watch, you're going to be in a, a boatload of trouble. Right. Things have changed and it's, it's hard to adjust when you've kind of lived in a fairy tale type world where you've been watching movies and TV to adjust to the new reality. Um, it's interesting that you had a great year. And I so, so did I. And I'm sure there are a lot of people that had great years. And, and, and perhaps they need to tell their stories of, of why they had a great year. I had a, actually a friend of mine I was talking to uh, last night who has been very successful in his business and he has to shut down his business. And then I told him, you have to think outside of the box. And I, I talked to him a little bit about you, how you formed your radio station and, and, and your radio show. And I said, you know, you have to think out of the box. You may want to form your own radio show because you're going to have people locked down maybe again uh, in the autumn and next year. And then the, the radio shows are going to be their only way of interacting with people. And the Zoom con conference that we're doing right now I have rebelled against this so much. The only reason why I'm doing this right now is my friend uh, Vince Joseph Jr. is an expert at this because I had tried to do these Zoom conferences and I just failed miserably. And I, I went to his uh, condo to do it and have him set it up. But people are gonna have to learn how to do Zoom because reality is gonna change. And right now we've been through a very tough year. The nation has been. Uh, been a good year for you, been a good year for my family, but next year it's going to be very tough and you may have to be sitting up in a cabin somewhere up in the mountains and only interacting with your family in other nations uh, via Zoom. Uh, I have friends that have started finally talking to me about their plans to buy properties over on either uh, Portugal, uh, uh, Costa Rica, or Panama, and they're finally telling me their plans. And they and I go, well, I think it's a good idea because they're concerned about what is coming. Uh, one of the things I talk about in uh, uh, Mark of the Beast is that there is a possible World War III coming. You're absolutely right. Mike, okay. what you've been saying, we've been saying this. So our Dreamweaver Artist Ranch, the reason why we chose Northern California not like I wanted to move to Northern California. It's the safest place to be because it's built on granite. We're half an hour away from Yosemite. Um, the property that we'll, we've looked at in Mariposa, uh, we're going to be put uh, 10 acres as we put aside to grow our own food because there's a food shortage. Uh, we have the water rights there in the Williamson Act, meaning we have as much water as we want. We have seven lakes on our property and we own that. And we ask people either donate or to sponsor, because it, it is right. There is another war coming and you can kind of see it and it's coming from the Middle East. You can kind of see it. So you're not crazy. You're right, right. on the ball. You're right on the uh, ball. Yeah, people did call me crazy. Honest to God, they did call me crazy. I, I remember people calling me crazy. But the difference between, first of all, before I go on to World War III, I want to comment to you what you did Buying those water rights there in Northern Cal California was probably the best thing you've ever done in your life. Because in addition to World War III, what I wrote about in there was a mega drought coming to the Southwest United States. And California has always been in the drought and I keep telling yes. you, so is in Nevada. And I go, guess what? You need water and you need food. And guess what, Mike? We have energy on our that. We have our own uh, hydro water plant. We have all of this stuff. So 2019, there was 5 million people that went to Yosemite. Imagine if we only captured 10% of that. It's like that last gas, gas stations um, 
place before you go to the desert. And so, wow. yes, people are going to be coming here from the arts. Matter of fact, I'm going to invite you because you understand what it's about. You wrote about it. I get it. Yeah. Well, I, I will come if you invite me. In fact, I would like to buy a cabin there if I could. Uh, well, you don't have to do put, that. Maybe put it underground. <laughs> well, here's the yeah. thing. So we have a company called Anonymous Tent. Uh, if you get a chance to call Anonymous Tent, the beautiful wooden structure, and you know wood has gone up almost 400%. Because all these bigger companies weren't prepared. They, you know, they, they bought all this stuff, sold it off, but they didn't have any access. It's stupid on them. You know what's happening with these bigger companies. So you understand. But when it talks about all the stuff like that, this again, that's why the, to me, the market of beast, what I've gotten through so far is interesting. How can people reach out to you on your social media links? Okay, well, I've rebelled all my life against social media. But my friend Vince Johnson Jr. is putting me up on that. And he just created uh, last week my own website. And if they want to reach out to me, uh, uh, please go to my website, markofthebeast666.net. We actually got that as a donate, domain name. So Mark, this could be easy to remember, markofthebeast666.net. Your interview with me, this video interview, as soon as you link it to me, it's going to be in the website. So uh, uh, it will be there. And then they, it talks about the play. It talks about me, my history. And it also gives you a spot where you can uh, send me a message. And I, I would love to hear from people. Uh, this is so new. I mean, like I said, it just went live. June 1st, if, if you've read half, of, if you listened to half of it, you may be one of a, only 10 people that have listened to half of it because it's just, it's just gone live. And so they, they, that's one place they can do it. I want to get back one more thing, but and that is about World War III. The difference between World War III and World War II is this, uh, and the World, for, World War III is coming and you're aware of it. World War II, uh, we fought World War II and we were the victors and World War II was fought over in Europe and Japan. The difference between World War II and World War III is this. It will not be fought in Europe. It will not be fought in the Middle East. It will be fought in the United States. And the loser is going to be the United States. It's, so that is the difference. You haven't got to that part yet. But anyway. no, 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 let me tell you this. You're absolutely right. I haven't told people that part yet because that's a little bit too deep for them, but you're absolutely right. So you're the only one besides my partner who we've seen this coming. And I'll take it a little bit farther. It's on the cyber war part of things because you could see what's happening by hacking into our systems. When, and again, I'm in the movie world, so I see a lot of these things come up. I'm talking to these screenwriters. I talk to these directors. It used to be in person. Now it's not going to be. Now it's going to be just like this. That's why I say telecommunications is not going anywhere. Neither are cleaning services. That's one reason why we're high enough up on our property because of altitude. Not, not too high because of altitude sickness, because of, of a tsunami and Chinese smog, just in case because of all that stuff. So you're right on the ball, but it's going to be a cyber war. And we found out from the movie, The Interview, when Seth Rogen and James Franco were making fun of North Korea, what did they do? They hacked into the East Coast and they hit the Venetian of what Sheldon Adelson was saying. If, if, if North Korea could do this, we already know what's being done, right? Right, exactly. And oddly enough, I was a uh, strategic arms uh, expert from Stanford University. I was I studied strategic arms at Stanford and under Wolfgang Panofsky, and I kept a lifelong interest in strategic arms. You're right. One of the strategic arms used in World War III will be cyber warfare. The other one will be weather weather modification. Yep. Uh, causing of droughts, causing of famines. Uh, the drones will be AI drones, and you may not even see them. And the bioweapons are part of the new uh, World War III weaponry. And that is the uh, 
uh, the different uh, viruses that are being created by, in bio labs. So World War III will be a cyber war, just like you say. It will be weather war. It will be uh, drones, uh, AI drones, uh, a certain type of uh, beams that are shot from uh, 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 the drones, and it will be cyber warfare. So yeah, you, it will be much different. It will not be like World War II at all. Right. So remember, Mark, you and I said this. We've never met before. You wrote about this. I see this coming. That's why the Dreamweaver Artist Ranch is important, because no matter what's going on outside the walls, it doesn't affect us on our property. Built on granite. We don't have to worry about San Andreas Fault. We see what's happening with Yosemite and other parks. 18 volcanoes are active. We don't have to worry about volcanic ash. That's why we're high enough up. Our ground is not as fertile. It's never had a fire on it. There's never been fracking on it. It's never been contamination. That's important for the food. And again, you know about the water rights. And the technology that I found, it's not in the US. It's most of the best technologies outside the US. So we're gonna be showcasing it just like the Disneyland. Think of Sundance Inst you know, Institute and Disneyland. We're smack dab in the middle, right next to Yosemite, 25 minutes away from there. That's why we're okay. Think about that one. Brian, it sounds incredible. It sounds absolutely incredible. You are dead on, spot on. You're way ahead of the curve. And you're living your life going against the herd has paid off and you're way ahead of things. So I'm so glad I, I got a chance to meet you and, and have an interview with you. So you put well, I'm gonna your... I'm gonna invite you. I'm gonna have you. Okay, I know. I'm gonna give, give you my website next after, year. I mean my email. And uh, you, you make sure you put me on your, your email queue. Oh, you're not going anywhere. Okay, I, good. You know, I, I know who you are now. So okay. one last thing. Why, why would people want to pick up your book and read it? Why would they want to pick it up and listen to it? Um, good question. Uh, I think it will, I wrote it to help people. Uh, it is sci-fi. It is Bible prophecy, it is nonfiction as well. But right now, um, it's tough to find, um, I don't know, it just seems like the media is so off. Uh, some of the stations are hard to, to listen to. Um, I would ask them, it will maybe help them confront the world that is approaching over the next three years to at least be forewarned uh, about some of the things that could happen. And when they do happen, uh, I have a feeling that when these things do happen, that they will ca cause nervous breakdowns in people. They will literally uh, go into depression and have breakdowns. And I think it's going to help them if they're able to get through the whole thing, it's two hours and 45 minutes. It is dystopian, but I put some humor in it. It's not completely a dystopian. It will help them confront and survive in the years ahead. It's obvious to people now that the world has changed. Yep. And it's, it's hard to know how much it has changed, but I, it's dramatically changed in a World War III a uh, desertification drought uh, will change the Southwest United States. Uh, a, another pandemic this autumn will, will just destroy it. And so I, I just suggest people that they uh, listen to it, struggle through it. It's not going to be easy. I made it a difficult read, a difficult thing to listen to. And I did that on purpose because I want adults to, to do it. And I wanted to challenge them to, to follow the scenario. I have time travel in there. Uh, I have uh, visions in there. There are some demonic characters in it. And probably the most important thing that I did was I put psychopaths in the script. And the reason why is I believe, like some other people believe, that the psychopaths pretty much control things here in the United States. And I was raised by a psychopath. And so if they can see how 
a psychopath or a demon is going to approach them, uh, they will be able to understand how to deal with them when it happens to them in their lives. There is this caricature of demons in, in movies and in literature that is totally false. They portray demons and the devil as some hideous looking creature with horns and a horn tail. That's ridiculous. That's not the devil at all. When the devil approaches you, as same as a psychopath, they come to you as an angel of light. They are charismatic. They are charming. They are funny. They are your best buddy. And they will promise you everything. And the thing about demons that people have to understand is they are very powerful. If they promise you they're going to make you a Academy Award winner, they will follow through with it. But you will lose your soul. And so I, I try to put uh, psychopaths in there so because I was so influenced by my father's psychopathy that I wanted people to uh, start being aware of what a psychopath looks like so they can deal with them. So, Mike, I want to thank you for this because I understand what you're talking about because it is happening. And I know our connection is going to get spotty in a minute. So with that, I have to always say that if you see someone without a smile, please give them one of yours because the world needs it. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. This is not the last time we will see you. And I'm Brian Sebastian with Movie Reviews and more. And we will see you next week.